One of the very simple thing I'm going to ask you right now. Tell me about the solid principle. I don't want you to explain all the solid principle. Just tell me what do you mean by solid? Why do we need it in our real time programming or in our day to day job? And explain me the single responsibility principle first. Okay, go ahead. Sure. So, uh, solid principle are one of the principles, uh, like design principles, which were introduced. And the main reason, like the main idea behind solid principles, was to make our code cleaner, uh, to get structure, and to reduce dependency between uh, code. So, for example, if any change is done in one part of the code, it should not affect. the other part of the code that was the main idea behind solid principles now solid principles is a combination of five principles uh, first is a single responsibility class a uh, single responsibility uh, class like a principle like you mentioned second is open close principle which is open for extension close for modification we have l for lisk of substitution principle we have i for interface uh, segregation and we have d for dependency inversion now the last part of the question you mentioned like to define the uh, segre uh, sorry uh, single responsibility principle srp yeah single responsibility principle has to do with the fact like the principle itself states that uh, a class should have single responsibility like it should be responsible for only one action for example if it is interacting with the persistence layer so it should only do only uh, do database operations if it is uh, like a service la- service layer uh type of class then it should only deal with business logic uh the reason behind this is that if it only deals with uh one responsibility then there will be only one reason for change and if there is only one reason for change then there is less possibility that we are cha- that it is impacting other parts of the program and hence introducing bugs in our program so krishna is all about you said like will only a class will have only one action like we should have one single reason for change if you are changing a class okay uh, so how do you want to define this term responsibility like let's say there is some code is there right or you are writing some code maybe you are going to a project opening a class seeing a lot of code okay and how do you think this class follows srp like what is the parameter that you're going to be taking into the consideration whenever you're going to be measuring if the class violates srp or not violating srp right uh, like i can explain this with an example yes, so yes, please go ahead. what what this principle basically suggests us is that we should move away from uh, like general purpose classes so for example in a scenario where we have uh, for example a vehicle class uh, vehicle class is driving also it is doing maintenance also and uh, it is uh, like having insurance claim also all these methods if they are covered if they are covered in the same class then it will lead to a violation of the srp principle because the vehicle class cannot be responsible for all these things it should only be responsible for driving we should have some other class for insurance policy related issues we should have some other class for maintenance right so that is the whole idea So it's like you know how many reasons are there to change a particular class? If there is one reason to change a class, this follows SRP. If that, like if we have more than one reason to change a specific class, then that simply violates SRP. That's the point that I can take out of our conversation. I'm going to be showing you a class, okay? I'm going to be showing you a class. You just go through the code, okay? Like I have not written any fancy code. Simple thing. You just tell me, Abhilas, this follows SRP. Or doesn't follow a survey. If it doesn't follow, then this is why I think so, and this is how I can, like you know, change the classes and create new classes. Or this follows a survey. There is no need to change anything. Okay. I'm sharing my desktop, uh, Krishna. Uh, let's just go through the code a little bit. Okay. There is a class called Authentication Manager. You are able to see this one, right? Yes, yes, I'm able to. Like this is a class which is going to take the responsibility of, uh, you know, log login and the logout stuff, and like if a person is able to log into an application, okay. And there is some login and logout methods over here, and along with that, we have a hash password method which is going to help you to hash a password. The algorithm goes over here, okay. This is the first method I want you to see hash password. the second method that i want you to see here called user exist in db this method responsibility will be like it will take a username and password 
and then like it will check if the user exists inside the database right and these are the methods which will be used by our login method so there is a method called login here okay you can see the login method i'll tell you what's what's going on over here basically this login method checks if the user exists in the database you can see it's accept a username and password in the parameter then we are hashing the password using the hash password method that i have over here okay this hash password method will help you to hash a password as i said so we are first taking the password from the login method and hashing the password getting the hash password and using that hash password right now i am checking the username and the password giving it in the parameter of this method called user exist in the db that's this method that i have told you that we have a method which will help us to check if the user exists inside the database and now this uh, user exist in db method is just giving me a boolean value if the user exists inside the database and if the user exists inside the database if this is true then i'm writing some login logic and allowing my user to log in and you can see i have a logged in username variable which is assigned to null i'm setting the username i'm saying that okay this is a valid user okay krishna so the login method will just help me to log in if the user exists in the database that's a simple line and there is a logout method this logout method will just do what it will just assign the logged in uh, username to null if the user exists this login method will set this variable to whatever the username is and if the user click on logout that this method will make it null that's it and there is a get username method which is going to help you to get the username it is going to return you this variable called uh, logged in username okay that's it okay i have a login method i have a logout method i have a get username method and couple of other methods one method is going to help me to hash a password using some algorithm and there is another method which is going to check if the user exists inside a database okay by taking the username and password now tell me krishna if this follow the srp um i think ablash hmm. this doesn't follow srp Okay. Uh, because uh, there are like various reasons for changes uh, mm -hmm. within the same class. How many reasons are there to change this class? Uh, I am hundred percent sure about the user existing database because mm -hmm. that logic and that method should be in the DAO layer and the DAO class. Okay. Uh, so that is one, and mm -hmm. uh, I am not hundred percent convinced on this, but. Uh, seventy eighty percent convinced on the hash method, a uh, hash okay. password method also. Mm -hmm. Why do you think? Be, why do you think the hash password method should not be here inside this auth manager class? Because it is dealing with uh, business logic, of hash. Like uh, it is, uh, it has logic to uh, hash the password. Exactly. So, like various various uh, algorithms like SHA two five six or those encryption. Algorithms can be used, so that so we can have easy. various various algorithm hashing algorithm. So now, if this is having one sort of algorithm in future, if I want to change, uh, if I want to implement another one, then this will change, right? Okay. Any okay. other thing? Any other thing, Krishna? Uh, Look at this login, logout, get username method. This can be there inside the same class. Login, logout, like over based on current implementation, I don't feel. But later on, if we are having some other implementation for logout, I think that should also come un, under a different class. Uh, like if we are checking for some variables or we are writing some logic in that, mm -hmm. then. Uh, so how many reasons are there, Krishna, to change this particular class? Now you have mentioned about uh, three different reason. The first reason is if. I want to change if the user exists in DB. This this method, the way it works. Like uh, tomorrow, if I want to face the data or face the user information, not from the database but from LDAP server or from some server, then I have to change this method. Hash password. You mentioned like if there is a change in hashing logic or hashing uh, algorithm, then I have to also change this particular class. So a couple of regions already. So obviously this powers SRP. So good job on that. And uh, right now, the log the logout method, the login method, and the get username method. This will change when if I want to implement something differently with my login stuff. Let's say right now I'm simply just checking if the user exists in this, and then if yes, then I'm letting the user to log in. But tomorrow, let's say I want to add two, three more checks, uh, then I'll have to come to this method. Then I have to bank this method. 
right? So, so far there are three regions to change. So if we want to take the hash password method to a separate class, this will be good. Next one, this DAO thing that you said, the DB thing, we can separate it with a DAO class, okay? And then we can keep this logout method, the get username method, and the login method inside the same class for now. But yeah, in future, if there will be something will change about our, about our login flow, um, then we only have to change this particular class. So there will be only one region to change. But yes, as you mentioned, that could be a reason if there will be something you want to do in the logout method specifically, you can separate it. But yeah, it's always like, you know, we should not over-engineer over the classes. We can keep it for like the logout method here inside the auth manager class. But in case you really think it has to be separated, then obviously it has to be on the developer, like, you know, how you want to design it. So there is nothing right and wrong. It's all about my perception. Okay. So good job on that. All the points are spot on. Good job. Perfect. Okay. I'll be telling you a statement. Okay. So tell me it is correct or not. Strings are immutable in Java, correct? Yes. Strings are if, immutable. If strings are immutable, Krishna, if there is a string, if I'll change that string, then there will be a new object will be created, right? Correct. If there will be a new object created, where that object will go? Heap uh, or stack? Separate object. Heap or stack? Heap memory. Perfect. Then if I'll create a lot of string objects, okay then don't you think my heap will run out of memory if the heap heap will run out of memory then the garbage collector will go and will try cleaning those objects from the heap memory which will make your application slower isn't it right so how java tackles this so uh java has a concept of a uh, string constant pool like it is oh, called string God. internal pool string constant pool both of this these things mm -hmm. uh, yeah i want to know about that no what it does yes go ahead please right so what it does is uh like when we are initializing a string in a literal form without using the new keyword uh the string constant pool which is like a space within the heap memory itself uh, creates an object for it. And the next time we try creating an object with the same string literal, uh, it does not create a new object. Instead, it, uh, it assigns the address of this object to the new reference variable because strings are immutable. So this will never change. And uh, it can keep, if if we have, for example, a Abhilash as the string name, and we have five string uh, variables, which are uh, initializing Abhilash, then there is no need to create five variables. We can refer the same uh, object in the string string constant pool. Okay, perfect. Um, I will show you a code snapshot, Krishna. Okay, you have to tell me how many objects will be created if I'll run that particular code. Okay, again, I'll be sharing my screen. Sure. Look at this code snapshot very carefully and tell me how many objects will be created over here. So uh, for S1, one object will get created. Okay, where it will be created? It will be created in the string constant pool within Java heap memory. Okay, and then in uh, S2? For S2, a new object will be created, but uh, within Java heap memory outside of uh, string constant pool. Okay. Okay. For Why S3, don't you think there will be a new object will be created in the, uh, like, you know, SCP also? Uh, because the uh, initialization of this uh, string, right? If we initialize string as a literal, mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, string S1 is equal to a literal hello value, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are creating that within the uh, string constant pool. But when we use a new uh, keyword, it creates that object. Uh, outside the string constant pool into uh, the Java heap memory. Okay. So in case of string S1, only one hello will be created inside the AC, that object, right? Then S2, okay. in S2, uh, in heap, it will be created or not? This object, hello? Heap, it will be created, yes. And in SCP, it will not be created, you are saying? No. It, it, like, uh, 
ideally like it should reference to this but because we are uh, reference to the s1 uh, uh, object but uh, because we are using the new keyword it will create a new object outside the string constant pool okay and it will not go to the scp because scp does not allow duplicates right okay now in s3 krishna mm -hmm. what will happen s3 will refer the object created by s1 so no new object will be created for so it will go to like it will refer to scp only refer the object. okay no object will be created then right right and in s4 in s4 i am confused like will it refer to the object created by s2 the new string uh, go with the same principle that you told me it's a new string i'm just writing hello there if it is a new string mean a new object will be created right and where it will go right to the heap it will it, it will go to the heap memory outside the string constant and then uh, will it go to the scp as well no it will not go to because that. already hello exists over there correct so how right. many total yes. objects krishna uh total three objects will be created okay. that's the answer okay good job i'll i'll show you another code snapshot okay look at this i have string s1 equal to 100 then i'm defining an integer object called number and i'm assigning it to 100 again okay right. then i'm converting this number to two string so number dot two string okay so it will be converted to string so like 100 will be converted to string like something like this and i'm referring to s2 now i'm checking if s1 equals equals s2 and if s1 equals s2 tell me first about the s1 equals equals s2 i'm telling if s1 and s2 both are pointing to the same object in the memory either in heap or in scp so what do you think right so uh, the main question between these points is like double equal to uh, e equates basically the address which uh, the reference variables are pointing to and equals method will actually check the uh, value within the strings and uh, i think the first uh, sys sysout would be false because s1 will be created in java uh, java heap memory string constant pool and s2 i think because it is using two string it will create a new string and then it will create into the java heap memory outside string constant pool so uh, that is the reason first will be false and second will be true because second in equals method we are comparing the values uh, not the perfect perfect answer like if s1 uh, like it will go to scp but now you are you are taking a number and converting it to two strings so if you do any concat operator or any kind of addition operation with a little string part then that will go to like the hip memory right so this will this will be there in the hip memory so this will be a new object and this will be a new object this will not point to the 100 object which is there already on scp right so this will be false and if i want to if I want this string, which is 100 right now, S2 is 100. If I have already an object here inside the ACP, which is 100. If I want S2 to point to the S1, then what I'll do, Krishna? Uh, then we can do like literal initialization. So string S2 is equal to uh, double quotes 100. So that will refer to the object within the string constant. I don't, want to, do that. To the I don't want to do that, Krishna. Let's say I have S2 right here. Okay, I have number dot two string here. Now what I want to do, I, I want this S2 object, which is right now created on heap. I want that to point to the say because there is already a string available, which is 100 uh, on ACP. I want this S2, which is there on heap right now to point to the ACP, point to this S1 reference. I want this equals equals S2, S1 equals equals S2 should give me true. Then how should I do that? Uh, there is a method we can use. Yeah, I forgot the method name. I intern, think it's intern, Krishna, intern. Maybe. Yes, yeah, intern. Yeah, intern. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's so that that's how we can do that. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so Krishna, going into the next question, let's talk about the hash map a little bit. Um, let's say we create a hash map of capacity thousand. Okay, we have a very big hash map, and I'm putting an element into that hash map. Let's say it is going into the third bucket. Okay. Uh, then again, I'm putting another element to the hash map. Let's say it is going into the 700 bucket 
or 2000 bucket if i've created a very big hash map of 10000 uh, then one is going into seventh bucket one is going into 9999 bucket right tell me how can i be sure about the fetch time here let's say whenever i'm pitching the element from the seventh bucket and whenever i'm pitching the element from the 9999 bucket so how much delay or lag it will be Okay, so how much? What, how do you how do you think about the page time here? Like, how will be defining that? Like, uh, which will be faster, which will be slower? Right. So here, uh, Ablash, in a hash map, we implement hash map using an array, and uh, we store like linked list or red black binary tree after Java eight. That is what is used to uh, mm. save the data there. But uh, you mentioned about the access. Time. So when when we fetch the element, what usually we provide is we provide the key. So uh, what hash map does is, uh, and what we have to do is uh, we have to provide a class uh, of the key uh, which has overridden the equals and hash code method of the object class. So uh, the usual flow of the fetch is that uh, I will provide the key. A hash code method will uh, create a hash code for using the key, it will multiply by into the n minus one, which is n, n is the size of the array. It will give us the index. And then at that index, uh, basically in that bucket, uh, Java will check if linked list or red black binary tree already exists. If it doesn't exist, then it will create one node of it and enter it. Like we have four parts of it. I think we have hash code of key, we save key value and then the next address for the next link list for the future. And uh, if there already exists, then uh, Java uses the equals method. That is basically a hashing collision scenario. So it uses the equals method to compare the keys uh, because in a hash map, keys should be unique. So if a key already exists with the same value, then we can't insert, uh, then, then we will fetch that key. Sorry, uh, this is a fetching operation. So we will fetch that key and Comparison between the key we have provided and the key which exists there is done using the equals method. Okay, so now my question is, let's say there is a element which is going into the seventh bucket, and there is another element which is going into the let's say thousand bucket. Whenever I'm pitching it, the page time will be equal or not equal? It it will be equal, I think, because go in one. array, yes, we go of one. Exactly. It's constant time. Doesn't matter like from which position you're facing in. I just said is you just say array of uh, buckets and those are index based, right? So whenever we're facing something from an index, it will be obviously giving me the constant time. Within the constant time, I'll be able to face the element. Perfect. Okay. So you explained me a little bit about the contract of the hash code and equals. Maybe we'll go a little more depth into that. But before it, uh, Krishna, I have another question. You just said, when you first create a hash map, let's say it's, cre uh, it's being created with 16 number of buckets, okay? Uh, or like the size of the hash map is 16, like the initial capacity. Let's say then you are adding some elements to the hash map, okay? Then uh, their indexes will be calculated. You said their hash code will be generated based on that, the N, like the uh, I will be calculated to which index the value will go, okay? Let's say the hash map becomes 70 or 75% full. You know, there is something called load factor. After that, the size will grow. It will double the size. That means the next time it will be 32. Okay, the size of the hash map. My question is, when the hash map grows, okay, and when the size became double, do you think the elements which are already exist inside that hash map, will their value will be recalculated? Will their hash code will be recalculated and the index will be again assigned? Or don't you think like there will be no recalculation will be needed, the size will be doubled, and the new elements will be keep will be keep on putting in the new indexes. You understood my question, Krishna? Yes, uh, yes, I I agree with that point. Like uh, when the hash code grows, uh, when the uh, hash map grows, like it call, uh, uh, crosses the seventy five percent threshold, which is 12, uh, 12 mm. elements, so it grows, right? And how we are calculating the index, we are calculating the hash code. This value will never change. But when we are calculating the index, we are multiplying it by n minus one, right? Now, if for example, I've entered the uh, entered like a key value pair, when the uh, 
uh, size was 16. So for example, I got index one, but if uh, later the index, uh, because of uh, more elements being added, the size became 32. Now, if we don't recalculate, the n value will change from 16 to 32 and then hash code will remain same, but index will change. So I think when we expand, we also need to recalculate. Perfect. Good job. Okay. Next question. Next question, Krishna. Can I enter a couple of null values into a hash map? Null values or null keys? Okay. Null keys. So uh, yeah, hash map accepts null keys. Like the zeroth index is by default the place for uh, uh, null keys, null based keys, and mm -hmm. it accepts null keys. Let's say I'm and entering. Values can. Let's say I'm having a couple of entries, Krishna. One is uh, null uh, as the key, value as Krishna. Second one null as key, value as Avilash. Then what will happen? So uh, in that case. Uh, we can only have one unique key, right? And a key will have only one value. We can't have multiple values associated to a key. So the last entered value will remain. Uh, it will replace the earlier entry. And it will so go to the zeroth uh, bucket, you said. Value. Yeah, zeroth bucket. Null by default will go to the zero. No exception, Krishna? Sure. Uh, I think yes. No exception. Okay. Accepting it. Perfect. Let's go to the next question. Obviously, there will not be exception. Whatever you said is like the sound the thing will happen. Okay. Going into the next question, Krishna. Just tell me, like um, in Java, multiple inheritance is not possible, right? So with cla with uh, with classes, we'll not be able to implement multiple inheritance. But with interface, we can achieve the similar kind of thing. So why do you think so Java is not allowing you to achieve multiple inheritance with classes versus allowing you to achieve multiple inheritance with interface? Right. So uh, the main reason behind this is uh, the diamond problem of life. Uh, when we do it with classes, we encounter a diamond problem. So I'll ex explain it with an example. For example, we have a, a car class. Uh, that is the base class and we are inheriting the car class into petrol car and uh, electric car, right? So we have uh, now two classes which inherit the car class and uh, later on we are uh, inheriting like if we, for example, if uh, Java supposedly allows multiple inheritance and if we supposedly go for a hybrid car which supports petrol and electric both. So uh, we should be able to uh, inherit both of these petrol and electric car. Uh, electric car classes. Uh, but the problem will arise in the case that uh, uh, they both will have one method, one or more methods from the parent class car, like for example, drive. So uh, by default, subclasses should have their parent uh, parent class methods, either they should override it or they will have one copy of it. So from the car class, they will get each petrol and hybrid uh, electric car will get a copy of it. And then if we do a multiple uh, inheritance onto the uh, hybrid car, then a uh, hybrid car will have a copy both from petrol and electric car. But then that creates an ambiguity problem because the method signature for both of them is same. So uh, that is the reason it is not uh, valid in classes. But in interfaces, uh, what happens is we can only have default methods or we can have abstract methods. So in that case, even if we a situation arrives when there is uh, two interfaces which have same method signature and we are uh, implementing it in a single class, like multiple implementation in a single class, then uh, as it is, they are abstract methods. So you can uh, override them in the implementing class and define the body. So that will not be a problem. Okay. So you said uh, an interface will have uh, either default default method or one more you said uh, abstract method or we can have abstract abstract method. method can we have private method or static method inside interface i think we can have static methods also private methods i don't know just asking i'm not sure i am not sure you think that. there is something java people have added maybe in java 9 or something so the interface supports 
static and private methods. Not sure. You please check it out after the interview. I'll add the clue over here in the video itself. Okay. Uh, all right. Go. Let's go for the next one. But the first and the like, you know, first one, whatever you said is perfect, uh, Krishna. That's why, you know, like Java allows, um, you know, multiple inheritance through the interface. It's not like allowing. It's like we can achieve the similar stuff. But with classes, it's not possible. Uh, why don't we have any constructor inside the interface, Krishna? Can we have constructor inside the interface? Can we define it? We cannot have constructors in interface. We can have constructors for abstract classes, but we cannot have uh, constructors for interface. Reason behind it is that we cannot create uh, objects of an interface. Like we have to implement the interface and then the implementing class will override methods and then you can create object of that implementing class. Okay. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. Let's go for the next question. Tell me the difference between function and by function in Java 8. Right. So uh, function and by function, these are nothing but functional interfaces. Uh, and functional interfaces are those kind of interfaces which have just one method, right? Uh, function and by function were introduced in Java 8 as part of functional programming, introducing functional programming into Java. So like what happens is with data uh, in variables, we are able to uh, assign variable data uh, and we are able to pass it as arguments within uh, within the code, within the program. But uh, early prior to this Lambda functions and uh, Lambda expressions and functional interfaces, we were not able to do the functional programming part, which is uh, we were not able to pass uh, or assign code code uh, to variables. Functional interface using these functions, uh, these uh, interfaces like function, uh, function by function, consumer by consumer, predicate by predicate has given us that. And uh, coming back to the original question, I digressed a little. Uh, function, uh, like I mentioned, it is functional interface, so it will have fun, uh, fun uh, method. So uh, the method name is apply, and it takes one argument as input and gives uh, a result. Uh, similarly, in by function, we have a apply method which takes two arguments as input and gives a result. Uh, now there are also things like we also have default methods in uh, function and by function, like we have and then default method in uh, uh, in in our uh, by functional interface. By can you give me an example? Or can you just give me an example with function with and then function included? Like just think about the example and give it to me. Like let's say you have something to achieve with this couple of things, then how like you'll be performing any operation. Come up, come up with any examples that you want. Sure. So uh, like we, we will take an example of uh, uh, using and then I'll try to uh, multiply by two a given input and uh, using apply function i will try to uh, multiply like uh, multiply amongst e each other the two elements i gave and all all of them will be of integer type so okay. uh, my functional interface like lambda expression for by, for by function would be x comma y in brackets and then arrow and then uh, x into y will be returned and the return type would be the uh, by function interface. I will define maybe say A for example. And then for uh, and then uh, function, I will define uh, like because it takes a single input uh, and then it result, returns a single output like a function. So uh, I will do X, uh, the lambda expression would be X in bracket and then arrow would be uh, two into X, like I'm multiplying by two. So now if I want to uh, write like a final statement of it, evaluate it all together. So I will use the first uh, um, object I created for by function, which is a, a dot and then, and then in the bracket, uh, I will pass um, a dot and then, and I will pass, I think, uh, I, I missed that, but, and then we'll I understand what you first and then, yeah. 
Yeah, I understand what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead after that. Complete complete your statement, Krishna. Like, wh- right. what would be the final output? Then, final output would be, for example, if I give in apply, I give uh, uh, parameters as two and three. So first two and three will get multiplied. Uh, result would be six, and then uh, six will be uh, multiplied into two. So we will get twelve as a output for that. Perfect. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Like how we'll be combining this couple of things. Perfect. Okay. Now tell me, Krishna. Right. There is something called method overriding in Java, and there is also something called method hiding in Java. How these two things are different, and when you'll be using method hiding in Java on top of method overriding. Right. so uh, both of these concepts are to do with inheritance when we are inheriting from a, from a base class into a child class uh, method overriding comes into picture when we want to like there's a method in the base class which we want to give a different implementation in our child class for example uh, we have a class named car and then we have a, a child class named as petrol car and we have a drive function so maybe in uh, normal car we have a different implementation and we want to give a specialized implementation in petrol car so we will override it that becomes a uh, method overriding but method hiding is same in nature like it comes into picture uh, when we are inheriting from a, a base class to a child class but it has to do with static methods so uh, when we want to uh, change like the uh, implementation of static method which has been given in the uh, base class into the child class then we uh, basically override it in the uh, child class and that concept is called as method id so it it doesn't override necessarily but it hides the method hides the parent class static method okay when you override a method in java you use a notation called at override correct right is that a compile time annotation or a run time annotation uh i think it's a compile time annotation why do you think because so? if we if when when we don't add at the at the rate override a uh, compiler gives a prompt for it and when you're cl- let's say once you, let's say like when you compile something or when you run a java program okay this goes goes through multiple phases first your program compiles then the source code generated or the byte code generated then it gets loaded to the like you know system through the class loader and then it runs right let's say you are overriding something and you have used this annotation called at override you you told that like this annotation will check if the methods will be overridden in the compile time now my question is now when you run an application krishna do you think there is any value of this annotation do you think this annotation exist or it just discard during the run time i think it should exist and my reasoning reasoning behind this is that uh, we have to concept method overloading and method overriding mm-hmm. we generally call method overloading as compile time polymorphism mm-hmm. and we call method overriding as run time polymorphism just a sec uh, just a sec um your my question is related to that at override annotation the region that you have given me for the static method and the like the static uh, method region for uh, like a method hiding and overriding is perfect right i am agreeing to that now you have told me that at uh, override that annotation that we have in java there is a compile time annotation that is also correct now i just want to know when when we run a particular code okay and if we have a overridden method okay and it has been annotated with at override annotation that at override annotation will exist when the program is running is that annotation exist or is already been discarded by the jvm okay i just wanted to know this right. this annotation has I any think, existence uh, during when the program runs or it doesn't have any existence once the compilation is over once the source code generated once the program runs that annotation is gone like we don't need it anymore right i think uh, at run time we do not need this annotation yes not 100% yes sure. why am i you know it krishna because you remember there is something called retention policy that you guys have used to create custom annotation there is three type right, of retention right, right. policy source uh, like 
during the compile time, whatever will run. There are three types of retention policies and uh, at override is having the compile time retention policy. That's why it is, it is going to be discarded whenever the program runs, right? But any annotation that you are creating, you wanted that annotation to be exist during the runtime, will go with a runtime, uh, you know, retention policy. Okay, perfect, perfect. Like the explanation is clear. Okay, Krishna, just tell me like, you know, what do you understand about memory leak in Java and how you will protect your code from memory leak? Right. Uh, so memory leak is the scenario blush where uh, we assign memory uh, to any particular resource and uh, we forget to clean it and during multiple successive garbage collection cycles uh, uh, garbage collector is not able to clean that up and uh, the resource is still using the memory like it is allocating um, being allocated space but it is not actually used in the program that and that particular scenario it uh, results in like very decreased performance if like we have multiple of these resources and uh, especially in scenarios like uh, daemon based programs or uh, programs which are running on server which do not uh, like un unless we are doing maintenance on say servers uh, they do not terminate so in that kind of scenario this uh, memory leak problem will exist forever and uh, that that will cause a pro uh, lot of performance issues okay so what will be the good practice just to make sure that your program doesn't have any memory leak issue. So what kind of steps you'll be following or what kind of things that you'll be taking into the consideration whenever you write real-time code in your application? Right. So first thing would be like, uh, when we are done with using all the resources, deallocate memory or uh, close the connections of database or uh, any other part. Um, alternately, we can also use uh, try with resources uh, code block. So as it is, while we are doing uh, uh, SQL based uh, queries or we are doing uh, any other ex external communication, we encapsulate the code in try catch block. So we can use try, uh, try with resources, which automatically takes care of that life cycle of uh, closing the uh, connection when it is not needed. Okay. So try with resources, how does it work internally, Krishna? And that, that I'm not aware of it. No, you said like, you know, it's yeah, I, like it will work in only specific condition. Like whenever you have a class and it implements a, a marker interface called order closable that only you can put it, then, then only you can put it inside the try block and it will. Resources save. which implement uh, basically. The exactly. That's what I wanted to hear. That's what I wanted to hear. Perfect. Yes. Correct. Um, okay, just tell me right now, uh, like, what do you mean by threads in Java? Okay, and how do you think that these threads will be communicating with each other? Let's say if we have two, three threads, if I create it, how do you think they communicate with each other? Right, so uh, this is like threads basically uh, when we are running a program, uh, it, it is like a process. And process is divided into multiple threads. Like each process execution uh, is divided into multiple threads. When we are running like our normal program, we have just one thread, which is the main thread which is running. But uh, in multi-threaded applications where we want to do, uh, like simultaneously, we want uh, multiple threads to execute the program, then we can use multiple threads. Now, uh, coming back to the original question, which was how the threads communicate. So the why the scenario of thread communication should occur, right? So thread communication scenario occurs when we have multiple th threads accessing the same resource or the same code block, right? In that case, they use a concept called as locks uh, to basically lock a particular resource. Now, if supposingly there are four threads, one thread has locked a resource, then the other three threads can't use that. So how will they communicate with each other that I'm using the lock right now and I've released the rock and you can use it. So for that, we use thread communication and the main methods for this purpose is wait, notify and notify all. So exactly. this is how threads communicate. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Should I go into the thread thing a little bit? Yes. Yes. Okay, then I'll not go. 
All right. So, <laughs> all right. So the next question. Um, tell, uh, can you just tell me a little bit about serialization, Krishna? Like, what is your feelings and thoughts about serialization, and why do we need it in Java? Just like generally, just help me to understand this term a little bit. Serialization concept. Okay. So we mark serial uh, classes as serializable. Uh, which is like a marker interface so it does not actually implement any methods but it just marks the uh, class as serialization and why serialization as a concept is needed is because uh, we can package the object of that class uh, for transport so uh, that is the main idea behind it that we can securely package without tampering and then using deserialization we can deserialize at the other end and use it without any tampering from like attacker or third party like that okay all right good so just one last question krishna before we wrap up this java section you already okay. explained me about this interface concept right like why do we need it like with some proper example i just want to understand uh, there are frameworks like spring okay which uses interface classes and a lot of java components they advise us to code to an interface always they they use this term code to interface so why framework like spring always recommend us like code to an interface not code to a class like why do you think so it is important in framework like spring to use interfaces like for what purpose so there are like two three ideas coming in my mind for why this can happen mm -hmm. uh, first thing is uh, the dependency inversion of the solid principle perfect so perfect yes what it basically says is high level module should not depend on low level module it should mm -hmm. depend on abstraction so instead of having implementation class uh, reference uh, reference variable we should create a uh, interface reference variable and then we can assign uh, whatever implementation object we want uh, another idea is uh, to do with uh, like spring uh, auto wiring exactly right? so for example uh, like we saw the uh, authentication manager uh, example we are using one password hash function right now but later on we can have a different password uh, hash uh, function and that can be we can annotate it again and then the injection will happen uh, of that so interfaces is in general advisable because it does not lead a lot of changes and uh, uh, it is flexible in that way perfect all right accepting it uh, one last thing because your your explanation triggers me uh, to ask this question you explained me about the dependency inversion principle correct Right. Uh, well, what is that called? D solid. Uh, the D of solid stands for what? Dependency inversion principle. Dependency inversion. Yes. So, what is the difference between dependency inversion principle and dependency injection? Is this thing are same or different? Uh, they are related, mm -hmm. but they are not same. I think. So, dependency injection is uh, in Spring, where uh, the Spring IOC container manages. Beans, which are objects of uh, of the of our classes, mm -hmm. and dependency injection happens of those beans when we mark uh, the properties or getter or constructor, setter or constructor methods as auto wire. That that is dependency injection. But dependency inversion uh, is of the uh, fact that uh, modules like it deals with abstraction. So we should not uh, have high level modules uh, depend on low level objects. Like uh, we should not. Strictly couple them together, and uh, we we should not have like methods depend on uh, specific classes. Instead, we should have interfaces, and then it should depend on that. Perfect. So what do you mean by coupling? Coupling is how uh, how closely uh, linked the code is together. Like the parts of the code or the uh, parts of the code are basically linked together. And uh, Spring as a framework uh, is a framework like. its main and core functionality is that it helps us decouple or loosely couple our applications and it gives the responsibility of creating and injecting uh, objects to the framework taking it away from the uh, developer 
perfect perfect yep so i'm happy with that right for now like you know all the questions that we have discussed on the java section krishna will be moved into the spring and microservices after this all right it's not a game it's a